But, uh, and, and I'm sure that you have some of these very specific memories for hymns too. But when I think of that hymn, I think of a little uh, third grade boy that, uh, that died in our academy in Kenosha uh, sang, uh, sang for his funeral. And this was what they said, was that, was that him. And so whenever, whenever I'm kind of looking at him to be, thinking about him to be, trying to pick him to be, a part of the goal is what is going to grab, not in simply an emotional way, although there is that, but in a faith way. And that, and that grab is either sin, or death, or hell, you know, you can almost hear Romans 8, kind of, you know, neither light or death, nor principalities or power, things present or things to come, etc. You get that sense so that no matter what else comes, those promises and do that. I know this is not a time for questions, but uh, I'm going to ask you to share with us And that, you know, you're saying that that connects to that funeral. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, there are big moments in your lives, obviously. Weddings, baptisms, funerals. And as we choose the hymns for them, recognizing they're not just for us, they're for other people. So I know, like, for our wedding, there are hymns that we chose that every time those come past, I not only get the joy of that text of that hymn, but I remember our wedding, you know? Or, you know, or the baptisms that we've had, or funerals. And I mean, I know my, my father said, I want that, that hymn at my funeral. But in his we had all the hymns your dad wanted at his funeral. We'd be there all day. I know. <laughs> but, but, but we do, you know, it is, and that is for funerals, a way that we get to proclaim to, to the people that are there. That's kind of, you know, our last hurrah of history theology, you know, and so that is so important to think about. Like, what, are, what are we saying? The gift we have in those amazing eight plus things. There was a question about the author of God's own child and God is saying. Sure. Where was he later? I do not remember his story off the top of my head. I I know exactly where the book is that would answer that question. And it might not be in a box. <laughs> it might be in a box, but it might not. I'll look I'll look after church and see if I can find it for you. Because yeah, that's it's a great, great story. Well, yeah, just think the lyrics of that and the people were just singing is so powerful. Yeah. Um, our uh, organist, our choir director of last church, wrote an arrangement for that. He just scribbled it out, mm -hmm. and it was really good. And we used it several times. <laughs> I went and tried to find it when we were down there. Couldn't right. Find, couldn't it was, find it. It was stuck on a file someplace, but yeah. it was really good. But I really like the, you know, there's so much evil in the world. Uh, that line of Satan, you wicked woman, right. oh, now you're master. Right. If you ever get mad at the evil in the world, right, right there. Right. Just remember who boss. Yeah. Huh? All right. With all of that, let us pray. Blessed Lord, we thank you for your many mercies today coming to us and being our Savior. We thank you for the gift of music and the life that you have given us in this place. We pray that you would bless us now as we are strengthened by your word and spirit and that we would grow in faith and love. Your sons believe you, we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
That's not what most of us grew up with. And that is not what most preachers grow up with that are, that are Lutheran. And so this was kind of my question was, does this change anything? Does having the Lord's Supper kind of there all the time change what I, what I preach about, kind of how I preach the sort of the character of, of what the preaching looks like, all of those kind of things. So that was kind of my initial question. The second question was, can I get away from what I will call a Lutheran altar call? You know what a Lutheran altar call is? And it's not the offering. <laughs> get that out of your heads. Uh, a Lutheran altar call is, you're a sinner, Jesus loves you, come to the Lord's Supper. That's what I would call a Lutheran altar call. It is where the, the sacramental sort of part of the sermon, the connection with the Lord's Supper, is sort of a hook at the end of the sermon. And it doesn't really have anything to do with the text of the sermon. It's just sort of, okay, how do I end this thing? <laughs> so how do I land this plane? All right, I'm going to land by saying, come to the Lord's Supper. All right, now I'm done. <laughs> and now we can go have the Lord's Supper. And I have, I have done many, 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 many Lutheran altar call sermons. And I'm not saying that that is wrong. Okay? But my question was, uh, is that really the best that we can do? And how does that serve the text? the people in the congregation, the sacramental and liturgical life of our church, and all of, and all of these things sort of together. So those were the two, the two questions that were kind of thumping around in my head five years ago when I started. Was, one, what does having the Lord's Supper more, more often do? And then two, how do we actually preach sacramentally so that it isn't just sort of a random tack on the end of the service? So a couple hands. Heather and then Rick. Who's your last Lutheran altar call to God? I don't know. You guys will have to tell me. <laughs> so I and and the, and again, I'm not saying that that's wrong. The reason I call it an altar call in in um, revivalism, in kind of 19th century revivalism, you know, tent meetings, this kind of thing, an altar call is sort of the, 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 the preacher will work everybody up to a state where they are going to confess their sins and are going to declare that they have now become a Christian, that they have repented and become a Christian again. And that, that's called an altar call. <laughs> and in fact, uh, churches would literally have the front pew would literally be called the anxious bench. There's, no, there's, no, there's no, no problems with this at all, really. And so if you were in a state where you might be getting close to, be, to being converted, then they would usher you up to the anxious bench. And there would be somebody that would be holding their, you know, would be there praying with you to be converted. And oftentimes, the service wasn't over until somebody was converted. So sometimes people will be converted often <laughs> because I really, and this is just my own cynicism there, but I just wonder if sometimes people are converted because they want to go home, <laughs> but I don't know. So that's what, so that's where the altar call idea sort of comes from, is that this is the culmination of the whole thing, is that in, an, in a uh, evangelistic type sermon like that, everything goes toward this conversion at the end. Does that make does that make sense? Okay. And and that's kind of far removed from how we think of preaching and sermons and such, but that is very much our culture. You know? And and certainly people of a certain age can remember very, very well Billy Graham's sermons. And and also Billy Graham style sermons which were really similar to that. 
in, in many ways. Rick. Yeah, I'm wondering if so one of the things out that we might not be remembering. Sure. Um, in the old days, when I was a kid. Right. In the old days <laughs> in Saginaw Valley, Michigan. There, there actually was a physical registration for communion. Oh, sure. All the members had to come and see the pastor. Well, that's right. On the Friday before the service. That's right. And and pastors don't have the time to do that. Anymore. Yeah, there was um, and and there's there's kind of a lot of a lot of layers to that, but. Often in uh, in churches, the parsonage would be right next to the church. The pastor's study would often be um, in the parsonage and would have a separate door. Would have would have a direct entrance, so you wouldn't. If you were registering to come to communion on Sunday, you didn't you know go through the house. You went to the pastor, and, and he might have hours and say yeah, Friday yeah, afternoons yeah. or whenever. That's my father's house. That's where I grew up. That's where you grew up at. That really explains a lot about you, Rick. But he, he quit, I think he stopped sometime in the 50s doing that. And nope. I got to Minnesota, and the pastor at the church in Howard Lake was still doing it sure. in the late 60s for language. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, in a very... And there are a lot of things that go into that. One is just some is some practicality things. And I have felt occasionally, like in our uh, COVID sojourn, that we were sort of returning to pre-registering for communion and stuff like that. Um, but there was also the sense that um, you didn't go to communion unless you had uh, unless you had confessed your sins to the pastor and been absolved. From and that was kind of the older tradition. And that kind of moved into more of a, uh, I'll say a little more bureaucratic kind of a registration thing where you signed up and maybe the pastor would ask you some questions, maybe not, depending. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but that you're absolutely right that that structure does not lend itself to having weekly communion. Um, that would be very difficult for just practical speaking. Walt, did you have your hand up? Yeah, Walt? just, uh, it's, it's on the subject, but uh, those folks who were in the Catholic Church, um, it's about the power of liturgy sure. and, and the power of that every week, you know, sure. being in that situation. Right. Because we thought we had the, uh, the, Proctor, the guy from the, the Catholic Church that was mm -hmm. with in, in the study, yep. and also in the readings, it referred to the fact that the Catholic Church has all these problems with the, you know, the priests and you know, right? people getting, you know, robbing and stealing and all right. that. But the church goes on. You know, people sure. went to communion no matter what. Right? <laughs> no right. matter what. If the you know, a priest was a child molester, they still went to right. communion. And, and, and that's the power of the liturgy. Yeah. And that basically what I'm saying is that no matter what, the power of that liturgy goes on. Yeah. So no matter what's happening in the world well, or around you or right locally. And that's, that's and that's absolutely true. And that's and that's a part of a part of what I found very interesting about liturgical preaching preaching in the context of the liturgy is that um, is that the sermon is not simply a, a kind of it doesn't have a life of its own it happens in the flow of the service <laughs> it's not it, and it's not simply the readings that are the part of the context although well, that certainly is but the hymns and the people and the space and all of these things, and even more than that, you also have the context of the lives of the people that are actually sitting in the pew. So, and I'll, I'll get to you in a second, Mary, I promise. Um, so, for instance, right now, in my preaching, I cannot not think about the fact that I'm leaving in eight days. And chances are, you sitting in the pew that is somewhere in your head as well. 
and that that is probably bubbling closer to the surface. And so I can either ignore that and act as if that is not the case, which sort of distances the preaching from, I'll say, from reality. Or I can actually think about those things as it's being prepared. That's part of the, the context of the sermon here. This is why a sermon, every congregation should believe that their pastor is the best preacher everywhere, anywhere. Because he is their pastor. And because those sermons are written for them. And so they don't simply translate. This is why I don't like, I don't like internet preaching is because there's no context. <laughs> you know, I am not the pastor to the internet. I am the pastor to these people at this place at this time. <laughs> and that changes how the whole thing happens. Um, so that, so all of that's kind of swirling around there. Here. So in the Catholic Church, in order to receive communion, you had to go to church on Saturday afternoon right. and confess your sins and be right. forgiven. Otherwise, you did not go to that altar. Right, right. And that and so right, you had to go to confession. And so and and so there were there were a couple ways that you could do that. You could either just make that a part of your habit or not go to church as often, or go to church but not go to the sacrament. You know, or any any of those kind of things. So that's kind of my backdrop to what I wanted to study and kind of try to think through together is all of that. Um, step one was doing a, uh, was writing basically a chapter history of preaching in the Missouri Senate, and specifically uh, how preaching has been taught and how preaching has been um, kind of received and passed on. And so that, that was kind of a, uh, a survey. So I looked at every book that had been written in English for the last hundred years about preaching that the Missouri Synod used in their kind of in their teaching of preaching. Because we can go back and I can find the syllabus from how how preaching was taught in 1951. How many books was that? Because it seems like a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and that is what I was doing, that part especially was what I was doing when I was at the library in St. Louis. Back, you remember back in November, I did that little sabbatical where I was gone for about three and a half weeks. And so I just lived in the library and kind of went through and very systematically worked my way through all of these books. And many of them were published by Concordia Publishing House, some of them weren't, um, and, and just kind of looked at how that preaching was, was taught how it changed over the over the years and and kind of up to the present. So that's kind of one part of that. Another part of that, which I did a little bit of, but not as much as I would have liked, was looking at, uh, at kind of what was the popular preaching that people heard. And in the Missouri Synod, that answer was really, really clear. Walter A. Meyer and the Luther Hour. That is what people heard. <laughs> um, Walter A. Meyer and Oswald Hoffman, who was the Lutheran Hour speaker after him, um, are probably the, the two preachers in the Missouri Synod that have been heard more than anybody else. <laughs> Maybe more than everybody else put together. <laughs> because so many people would, would listen to the Lutheran Hour Sunday morning while they were getting ready to go to church. What do you mean did that? Or do that? I, it was very, very common. And in fact, in my um, in my study group, there were eight of us in my little cohort, um, and six of the eight were Roman Catholic, and then there was a Pentecostal and me. So so I was the token Lutheran, he was the token Pentecostal. It was great. And, um, and in that group of eight, three of those people had listened to the Lutheran Hour 
for years and years and years growing up. And I was not one of them. <laughs> okay, they were all free Catholics. And so they would listen to the Lutheran Hour and then they would watch Robert Fulton Sheen on TV. <laughs> because that's what you did. You know, and they grew up in the 50s and 60s. And, and so that, that preaching, that style of, of preaching, um, I would argue was probably more influential than anything that happened in the seminary classrooms. Because that was sort of, that was the bar. The, the you, know, you know, this is the guy that preached before hundreds of thousands of people. You know, this is the, if, if I can use the expression, the rock star <laughs> of, Lutheran, of Lutheran preaching. And so that, that did, and there were, Walter E. Meyer was the speaker for the Lutheran Hour for 20 years, roughly, 1931 or so to 1950 when he died. And there, and CPH published in that time period 25 books of his sermons. So basically, every sermon that he preached ended up being in a book or a devotional or something to that effect. It is very difficult for us to kind of fathom that level of loyalty. And we're talking all through World War II, we're talking all through the Depression, and where you can go and see um, uh, one of the most famous pictures of Walter E. Meyer is him preaching, uh, preaching at Wrigley Field with 100,000 people there in Chicago. And, you know, and anywhere you go, 100,000 people is a lot of people. And, and so that, that kind of um, mindset, and that continues with Oswald Hoffman. No, no doubt about it. Um, Oswald Hoffman, I didn't study as much, but I think there could be a lot said, uh, said for him too, because he was a Lutheran Hour preacher from roughly 1951 to 1988, I want to say. And there were some assistant or associate Lutheran Hour speakers through there as well, so he wasn't the only one. But he, but, you know, 35 years, basically. And again, you put those two guys together, that's, that's at least two generations. <laughs> that, that's the, that is who they heard. That was what it meant to be a good preacher, I would argue. Um, so, so you have that. And now kind of understanding that, recognizing that they never preached in front of a congregation. Nor was there the second. Right, nor was there ever the Lord's Supper or baptism or any of these things. They were preaching in a little radio room <laughs> and they, and then sometimes doing Lutheran Hour rallies or you know these uh, these events. But those, but that wasn't the bread and butter. The bread and butter was them sitting in a little radio booth preaching um, to it. And and how different is that preaching from what happened on? <laughs> Sunday mornings. And I, I think that's a, that's a fascinating question that really could be studied a lot because never, um, kind of never the direct context of the lives of the people right in front of you. I mean, and I, you guys have heard me preach a lot. And, and it is very regular for somebody not the same somebody, but different somebodies will say to me afterwards, I felt like you were preaching that sermon right to me. And a part of the reason for that, I would, I would say, is because good preaching is always contextual. That is, it's always speaking to the lived experience of the lives of the people that are right in front of you. And although each one of us is different, we do have kind of a shared life together. So it shouldn't be a surprise that if I'm kind of thinking about all of the fears and anxieties and angers and weirdnesses going into COVID, and I'm kind of thinking about that when I preach it, it shouldn't be surprising that you sound, you feel like it's written just for you. Because guess what? We live in the same place <laughs> and have the same lives. Or less. Catherine. Did you find, I mean, this is just making me think, you know, COVID was in some ways that sense of almost your version of radio. Yeah. 
But Absolutely. You know, and one thing that I mean, maybe this was a wrong thing to do, you know, because you know we had our four family singers here, and we had communions. No, no, we didn't. That's right, we did. We did. We did it. And, right. and in fact, we uh, we kind of talked about that quite a lot. Was would it be better for us to have a small communion service with some of us than to uh, than to simply not have the sacrament because we can't all gather? Yeah. And so, did you find kind of you're preaching with? I mean, obviously you're preaching with different because of all right. Time, but, you know, and so that was really more similar to that yeah. non-liturgical. Yeah, I I think so. And then yeah and. We did some things very specifically, though, to kind of keep the, I'll say to keep the churchly character of what was going on. Like, you know, it was right here. It was literally right here. <laughs> um, we didn't, you know, we didn't do it generally, excuse me, generally in my study. It was in the context here. We would, you know, we had hymns. We had, it was... It was a familiar liturgy, so there were, so anybody that was a regular member of Holy Cross should have been able to watch those videos and recognize it as something that, it wasn't the same, but it also wasn't different. Should be able to recognize that this is, this is connected to what I know. Does that, does that make sense? That, just um, something that you and all the elders, we had a lot of discussion about keeping the character of the, the service as close as we could yeah. without communion. Yeah. And we actually <clears throat> even had quite a debate about uh, confession and absolution. Mm -hmm. And I should, still have quite a debate in my own head about that. Whether we should do that at all. Right. And we decided it was important. Yeah. Yeah, and we did, and and I don't I don't regret it, but um, I do understand that you know what is it you know I don't believe that you can have a virtual community service or a virtual baptism. Why is a virtual absolution okay? Well, I would say the character of the word in that place is in that context is different than than the water or the elements of the sacrament. But I understand very well the question there, and I can kind of resonate to that. But if I may, Reverend Dr. Tavi Horn, SDM, uh, since we're under time, and, yeah. today, and I'm going to do this next week too. Okay. So we're not doing all of this in the next four minutes. Okay, okay. thanks. So my question is really All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me moving. Well, what well, was just what you, you referred to? I remember Lynn and I were confessing to a TV tube. Right. And I'm going, if I said, well, my confession is right, but this is just darn weird. Yeah. yeah. And and at some level, you just had to kind of embrace the weirdness. <laughs> and, you know, and say, okay, yep, this is weird, and we're going to do this all together, <laughs> even though it's weird, because we don't know how else to do this. And so, and that was one of the things that, I felt like we did well was that we kind of moved. We were weird together. <laughs> we moved through these challenges together, and it wasn't perfect. And you know, maybe we could have zigged instead of zag, but whatever we did, we did it together. And and that to me was tremendously important along the way. So, so I think we kind of wrestled the. This to the ground a little bit. There, there have been in the 20th century kind of various um, movements and articles and this and that written about liturgical preaching. Usually, what that means is sort of recognizing the Bible in the liturgy, recognizing that the liturgical service is um, is biblical and is a part of the context in which we preach. Um, I think one of the big questions that that still sort of goes on with all of this is liturgical preaching, or let's say congregational preaching on Sunday morning, 
assumes that the people that are there that are listening are Christians. Okay, let me say that one more time. Congregational preaching on Sunday morning generally assumes that people are Christians. You know? So when I'm talking about the Lord's Supper, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to um, a sort of a theoretical, uh, to, I'm not simply talking to a visitor who maybe isn't a Christian. Now they might be there. Right? I mean, we, we have visitors all the time. And they might be there. But for the most part, our Sunday preaching presumes that these people are Christians. Now, I do think that that also creates a challenge for us. And that is, how do we witness to, uh, to the world around us? How do we actually evangelize? Because... The sermons, generally speaking, that happen here are written for you guys. They're not written for uh, an unbeliever. They may overhear them, and they may benefit from them, but they're not the intended audience. They're kind of the side, the side audience. Does that make Does that make sense? Because that too, just so when I talk about sin with you guys, for instance. Um, I'm, uh, my talking about sin is also going to, to kind of assume that to some degree you know what sin is and you know that you shouldn't do it but that you still do and that's the problem that's kind of where I start right I'm not starting with let me, let me explain to you that you're a sinner there may be some of that but really the basis the baseline is you're a Christian Act like you're a Christian. <clears throat> and the fact that we can't always do this is part of why we need the gospel. Right. So in, in some degree, is it correct to say then that liturgical preaching along with a liturgical service itself is just the opposite of um, altar call yeah, preaching? Yeah, that is exactly and, right. And, and, and so what kind of percentage of Church Missouri Synod ministers are not in this group. Well, I, and that of course is a much bigger question, but I do believe that the, the overall question of how of, of how do we understand outreach, how do we understand where outreach happens and how outreach happens is a huge one because um, and this is a this is a side rant which I will just hint at, but I've got a lot of rants to get in in the next eight days. So, <laughs> um, and, and, but that is that the easy way to do evangelism, the cheap way to do evangelism, is a variation of make the pastor do it. Where, okay, we're going to make the Sunday morning service the service for the unbelievers. We're going to make that the seeker service. So that the pastor is now the evangelist, not the congregation. I, I am the most trained and the least effective evangelist in this room because um, I am not living your lives in the world with your neighbors and the people who you love and care for. And so I am always going to be, at some level, perceived as the professional Christian, right? I'm the pastor. I'm paid to be a Christian. I'm paid to be a pastor. And so that means that your testimony is, is to the people around you is far, far more effective than anything I would ever do. What I do is build you up and, 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 and teach you God's word and give you the tools and the pieces that are needed so that you can go out and love your neighbor. But if all of that, if we act as if all of that stuff has to happen on Sunday morning, then you've got the least effective person trying to do it, and everybody else forgetting that being a Christian actually means being in the world and loving your neighbor, and not, and, and you know, this is where God cares for us. There is where we, for, we care for the world. 
And, and when those get inversed, everything kind of goes haywire along the way. So all of this, we're, all of this is still kind of context behind what, what's been running through my head with this stuff. Um, I'm going to take just a couple minutes to start number three just a little bit. And I knew that this would take two weeks. So, um, so next week we'll finish this up. And we've got our, we've got, right, next Sunday we'll finish this up. Um, so, I'm not even trying to think if I can even do this shortly. I don't think so. I'm not even going to try. Okay, next week we're going to start with number three. And I'm going to talk about analogical and dialectical. Those are your 250 cent words for the day. So, and you're not even going to tell us what they are. I'm so not. really not. You can look them up. I've, got, I've even got some definitions at the bottom there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so you can you can start to dig around with that a little bit, and we'll and we'll kind of wrap that up for next week. So with all of that, let's close this sentence. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.